Welcome to Clarity Fund Podcast with Dr. Owen Anderson. We're continuing our series on rebuilding the historic Christian faith with Dr. Surendra Gangadi. And we're on episode 28 now. It's part 15, though, of our series on rebuilding the historic Christian faith. And so far, what we've done is we've looked at the what is historic Christianity? How do we understand that? And then we've looked at the major creeds of the faith, beginning with Acts 15 and coming all the way down to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in the last episode, we were considering challenges that have come up in the modern world that need to be addressed after Westminster. And today we're going to keep building on that, although we're moving into what has been called the postmodern world, because many people would say the modern world ended, probably ended around World War II. And we're now in a postmodern world where the ideals and the goals of modernity failed. And instead, we're looking to a kind of skepticism about getting to truth and knowing, having knowledge, and instead uh, replacing the the uh, ideals of the modern world with the skeptical age of postmodernism. So, Dr. Gainey, do you want to, to tell us a little bit about what is postmodernism and what challenges does it bring up for historic Christianity? Thank you, Owen. I'd like to emphasize that we're dealing with postmodernism not in itself or some particular aspect of postmodernism, but we're looking at postmodernism in the context of the historic Christian faith. And in order to focus this, I think it's helpful to think of it as in terms of the culture war. There's much talk about that. I don't think there's any disagreement. There is a culture war. But what I'd like to point out is that the culture war is between the culture of theism or the remnants of historic Christian theism and the culture of atheism. So we're taking that idea of culture war and connecting it by being specific with the conflict between theism and atheism. Now, now do you think, let's explain it a little bit, because do you think that both sides would identify that way, or might one side say, well, we're not really atheists, we, we still believe in God, but, and then qualify it somehow? Yes, um, the question is, what God? Is it the... God of historic Christian theism or some other God. The deists believe in God, but it was not the God of historic Christian theism. It was a significant departure from that God who not only creates the world, but rules the world. So whenever someone says, I believe in God, or we believe in God, the question comes up, what God? in relation to the historic Christian, the, uh, the God of historic Christian faith. So we will wait for that answer, should it be raised and see what is being said. Yeah, I would guess that it might be something more like um, deism or believing in the universe or a higher power maybe some kind of pantheism, but you're right, I don't think it would be God the Creator. So since we're talking about restoring the historic Christian faith, rebuilding that, we need to specify that. And from the point of uh, the historic Christian faith, other gods, whether it's the God of Deism or the God of uh, Islam, who is creator but not Uh, ruler in a certain way. That's not the God for our purposes, particularly in the West, where the culture war is going on. It's waged against the cultural remnants of historic Christianity. So, when it comes to the focus in Karl Marx, it becomes simply no God. It's a naturalistic worldview, 
Yeah, yeah he's a, kind of a materialist. Yes, it's explicitly so. And insofar as that is what is being maintained, it's between cultural atheism and cultural theism, recognizing that there are all kinds of degrees of consciousness and consistency. So that's the next main point we're making here. It's a spiritual war between belief and unbelief. And having said that, we need to say that we are, we all human beings, uh, in terms of belief and unbelief, are more or less conscious and consistent in our basic beliefs. <clears throat> the spiritual wars first, therefore, within each person and <clears throat> in terms of their, le according to their the measure of maturity, and people are at different degrees, they're more or less conscious and consistent. And it's in every relationship of life. So it's not just between believer and non-believer, but between belief and non-belief. We want to emphasize that so that this is a conflict going on in every believer, in every church, as well as those without the church, those who are explicitly atheists, or more or less consistently atheist or anti-theist. So there's a culture war. And may I say further, it's a war between good and evil. Uh, most can refer and relate to that. But even more explicitly, it's between basically different understandings of good and evil. So it's not just between good and evil, it's if the sides agree on that. It's different understandings of good and evil. And that's where um, it comes into focus. So that's my first point I want to make, and I'll go on <clears throat> to speak about the idea of equality in Christian theism and ways in which we are equal and ways in which we're not equal. Um, or not the same, I should say, rather. And in Christian theism, we are created equal as the image of God. We just specify that we're saying we're finite, temporal, changeable in our being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And being made in the image of God, we have the ability and the responsibility to know God. Now, <clears throat> we're different from animals in our capacity to think in terms of concepts, judgments, and arguments, and that is to be contrasted with perceiving through our senses. That needs to be emphasized because naturalists think all knowledge is from sense perception. So, by well, saying... I wonder if that's maybe how we got to postmodernism yes, is through is. empiricism. Yes, and we'll point out the specific actors. So, um, this affirms then that God is our creator. We're secondly equally fallen. Not only equally created, but equally fallen. So we don't say one person is better than another in that respect, or um, some race is better than some other race, as is, is some try to maintain. We're equally fallen. Um, no one seeks God. No one understands what is clear about God that is left to ourselves, all are equally in sin and death. There's equality again uh, in unbelief and the inherent consequences of unbelief, which, are, which is meaninglessness and all that goes with that. So that's another basic way in which we're equal, equally created, equally fallen, and we're all equally called back by the curse and the promise. That is toil, strife, old age, sickness, and death. All of us go through that. No one is accepted. So we're being called back from the evil of our unbelief, which is an act contrary to our nature as a rational being, failing to see reason. And there's, in this culture, culture war, that is a spiritual war between belief and unbelief, it's not just present now. It's age-long, 
and agonizing from the beginning of human history. We've gone through many ages and stages of human history. We might say that the current state is the last, it may be the final, the latest, it may be the final of a war. It has sometimes been represented as a many-headed beast, a beast with ten heads, so going from age to age, but essentially the same thing continuing. And we're now the stage, we may, may be the ninth, perhaps the final, maybe it's the tenth. And in this war between belief and unbelief, between good and evil, uh, it's affirmed in historic Christian theism that good will overcome evil. Uh, the war is launched from the theist, Christian theist side in the words of the gospel. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent of unbelief, of this root unbelief, failing to seek and understand what is clear, not and being in the state of meaninglessness. So there were equally called back. All human beings, not just uh, Europeans, but all nations are being called back. And again, we're equal in the sense all who repent are equally received by God and in the church, which is the body of Christ. Now that sets the stage to understand how we're not equal or not the same. As members of the body of Christ, we have different gifts, abilities, and these are given to build up the body of Christ. There are many members, yet one body. All members are to be equally discipled, and all nations are to be baptized and taught to observe all that Christ has commanded. All members are not equally mature in faith, that is understanding, without the first principles or the foundation, a believer does not grow to maturity. So even though all are believers and received, uh, we're not all equal in our understanding faith. And with regard to the conflict between believer and non-believer, what is clear to the believer is foolishness to the unbeliever without faith, without the basic things in place. So there is a spiritual war. There's a cultural war, which is a spiritual war, which is age-long and agonizing. And we're equal in many basic respects and not equal or not the same, rather, in some respects. Any thoughts, questions, comments about that? Well, that helps delineate the cultural war we might think about and the, the war being between belief and unbelief. And it takes a certain kind of turn in the postmodern age. Yes. Which is an emphasis on individual perspective and the relativity of uh, morals. Yes, that would, I don't, I don't uh, say that I don't say that lightly because I think there could be a an easy critique of relativism which I'm not yeah. suggesting. What but we're going to do is take this a little bit farther. Yeah. About uh, the gospel and um, we'll be concentrating mostly on the postmodern Marxist, neo-Marxist side of things after this, okay. but specify the basis of the difference a little bit more. The yeah, Gospel no, call that. men everywhere to repent of sin, the root sin of not seeking and not understanding what is clear about God and man and good and evil. We'll see this is going to be essential in distinguishing the, what's going on in the culture war. We're to receive forgiveness and cleansing of sin in Christ, who is the eternal Word of God incarnate, crucified, risen, and ruling, and to advance his kingdom in all the relations of life. That's where it gets into the culture. And that's where it has been, and the remnants of historic Christianity are with us, and it's been decimated greatly by unbelief in the modern world. And we'll get into that and specify persons there. So um, 
the, the, the war, the culture war in our day is between cultural Marxism and cultural Christianity. And participants in this war are more or less woke on the Marxist side or awakened on the Christian side. Let's just say all of us are more or less conscious and consistent. Uh, first or foundational principles make it clear where the lines are drawn. So I want to go next to the foundational principles in order to delineate uh, where this culture wars and how it's unfolding. Now, philosophical foundations are deepest. Philosophical foundations begin with epistemology, then metaphysics, and then ethics. We want to emphasize the order. The line in epistemology is drawn between clarity, which maintains that some things are clear to reason, that is, knowledge is possible, and um, <clears throat> again, some things are clear, and nothing, excuse me, nothing is clear to the senses, just as we see some things are clear to reason, here it is, nothing is clear to the senses. So you can see how we may be missing each other if we don't specify those. And as a consequence of that, either knowledge is not possible, skepticism simpliciter, <clears throat> and fideism, belief without proof based on understanding. So that's where the lines are drawn in epistemology. In metaphysics, the line is drawn between only some, that is, God is eternal, and either nothing is eternal or all, whether it's matter or spirit, is eternal in some form or other. So again, we're drawing the lines, philosophical foundation, and ethics and metaphysics, excuse me, epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics. It remains to be seen whether this is the way to draw the line, or we should draw it in some other way, whether there are no lines to be drawn. Now, in ethics, the line is drawn between the good, which is the end in itself, is based on human nature, and it's fundamentally rational. That's one side in ethics. Or, the other side, the good is not based on human nature, or human nature um, <clears throat> excuse me, or there is not a human nature, or human nature is not fundamentally rational. So we'll see that Marxism and neo-Marxism comes out on one side. And um, historic Christian faith, while it will affirm the former, is not always consistent with that. I have to keep emphasizing there's a lot of divisions among theists and a lot of divisions among non-theists. So we're more or less conscious and consistent in our basic beliefs. So it's between belief and unbelief with all kinds of admixtures there. Now, um, in ethics, that view about the good is based on human nature, which is fundamentally rational, leads to the view that the earth, the good is that we're working toward is the earth filled with the knowledge of God. Now, consistently, that's where it goes, but these have not held consistently to that, and the Marxists have come in and offered an alternative view of the process of history and the city of man, utopia. And uh, the, on the other hand, the latter leads to hedonism, pleasure is the good, or virtue as the good, which is deontology, Kantian view, and that is rewarded by some form or other of non-cognitive mysticism. So both hedonism and mysticism are alternatives to the view of the good as the knowledge of God. And we'll see that what uh, Marx argued about religion as the opinion of the people who speak about a non cognitivist view of um, heaven, and um, that's just not historic Christian faith. 
although many in history by way of tradition have held to that. So I'll pause there and see if the comments to be raised. I know our time is fast moving on, so... I'm yeah, I think, that, I think that's good to keep going. It's interesting, right. as you're discussing Marx, I'm realizing, uh, remembering, I, I think he really is more of a modernist in his understanding yes. of knowledge and good and evil. Yes. And so there's a line that comes from him down to what they talk about today as a neo-Marxist, which is yes. somewhat different, which I think you'll probably get to when you look yes, at Yes, I'm the, getting to that shortly. Yeah, now, both ahead. sides in the culture war are divided depending on how conscious and consistent each is. Without a clear view of good and evil, divisions deepen, whether in theism or non-theism. On the other hand, the greater the clarity concerning good and evil, the greater the unity. There's a great desire for equality, we speak rather the uh, unity of diversity not a unity based on sameness. So these are the fundamental points. Now, going on, Marx is a child of Enlightenment skepticism coming out of Kant and Hegel. And he's a poster child of postmodern skepticism. So you mentioned earlier, yeah, he's modernist. He's 18... 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. He's in the middle of modernism. Now, from deism of Descartes and Locke to the Hume and uh, Wolf, Kant's response to these uh, unfolding of inadequacies of rationalism and empiricism his response to that kind of skepticism simply deepened the skepticism. He did not resolve it. And he deepened it by dividing between phenomena and noumena, the world as we see it, as we process it with our categories and forms of intuition, outer and inner, and the noumenal world, the world as it is in itself. So his analysis of causality as only subjectively real was we want to say carefully, but yes, definitely, it was disingenuous. It was disingenuous because he failed to recognize the causal relation between the noumena as the cause of the phenomena. He made the distinction and implicitly said it was causing, but failed to do it explicitly. So is he or is he not? denying causality in an ultimate sense. He also did that in the morality of his libertarian free will, where ought implies can versus want. And it was required of him by his libertarian uh, view of free will um, to deny uh, causality in order to make room for freedom and morality. So there's a double denial of causality and there's a double error in Kant on this point. At least I would maintain that and want to argue for that. Now Hegel supplied a view of spirit in a pantheistic sense to supply the noumenal realm. What is there? And this spirit is unfolding in history phenomena by a supposedly rational process of dialectic between ideas, where there's a thesis opposed by an antithesis, forming a synthesis over time in history, for which there comes now an antithesis. So Hegel assumed without argument Kant's skepticism Kant's unknowable God, which he supplied by pantheism, cannot be known except in following history, and the reduction of religion to morality, Kant's deontology, uh, uh, religion within the limits of reason alone, specifies. So Hegel accepted that. Now, in turn, Marx assumed and one-upped Hegel by rejecting spirit 
as an underlying force in history, by with an antithesis of spirit. And so he moved from Hegel to a dialectical that was material, and essentially economic material in place. Uh, <clears throat> and that this dialectic is going on between uh, two economic classes. Those are owners, the bourgeoisie, and workers or the proletariat. In this view, capitalism, where man individually owns absolutely, will be replaced by communism, a classless society in which man collectively owns absolutely. Now, we're going to say that th those are antitheses, but that antithesis is an antinomy because they both share assumption on one side of the culture war with regard to basic things are clear. I need to emphasize that as strongly as I can and repeatedly. So both capitalism and communism are antitheses where man owns absolutely either individually, capitalism, or collectively, and that's going to be a never-ending struggle. You want to say it's neither man individually nor man collectively, but God as creator and ruler owns absolutely, and man is called to stewardship. Now, the struggle in Marx is one of power, not of truth. For a good that is um, material, not spiritual, in which those who have do not increase production, but take by oppression from those who do not have. So the concern becomes in taking from those who have by oppression, the concern with fairness, not the concern with efficiency. So um, in Marxism or neo-Marxism, that concern with fairness or equality of outcome is set in a context about human goods where it's not a matter of increasing production, but simply distributing what there is because one owns by taking from another. Now, this view assumes an earlier statement by um, Rousseau, who says man is born free and noble, but is now everywhere in chains. So for Rousseau, evil comes from without, outside of man, and that we're victims um, of an evil society or class in that society, not from within, as in historic theism, that evil arising by denying one's own rational nature, failing to seek and understand what is clear. So man is thrown back in this view into a kind of Hobbesian world of incessant warfare, except it's not individual conflict. It's a class conflict. And um, in the theory of dialectical materialism, um, based on a purely materialist versus theistic view of man, having failed to, excuse me, the, the theory of dialectic having failed to materialize in actual working in history after the loss of millions of lives in Russia and China and Southeast Asia and elsewhere in the world um, <clears throat> and resisted stoutly in the uh, post-World War II Cold War, 1930s to 1989, uh, that um, theory of dialectical materialism morphed under German and French and Italian and other European thinkers, Marxist thinkers, um, into neo-Marxism. And it's summed up in what's been called critical theory. Oppression is not only between economic groups, but by racial groups, by gender groups, 
And wherever there is a power disparity by virtue of varying class identities. So neo-Marxism continues the theme of oppression of one by another, but they expand it now to various classes. They'll talk about classes, but these classes are identified variously. Now, critical theory denies that there's a meta-narrative that is to be privileged, given their skepticism. Differences is not of truth, which is unknowable, nothing is clear, including there's no essence of human nature to be known. All is a material flux, from the Greek materialist, whether it's Democritus or Heraclitus, or Epicurus, or the way it was raised by, uh, re-raised by Nietzsche. And it's available only to varying perspectives of the senses. Think of sexist empiricism, his skepticism, leaving, on, uh, leaving us in skepticism. That was there in the ancient world in Protagoras, where man is the measure of all things. Now, this skepticism is essential to neo Marxism and neo Marxism. Marx never argued for his view that religion is the European of the people. Notoriously ambiguous statement. What do you mean by uh, religion and whether all are religious? You can go into that, but not now. So claims to truth and objectivity are necessarily false, flawed in light of skepticism, and they're to be deconstructed has shown to be an ideology used to gain and keep power. So it's all a matter of interpretation, construction, and, uh, and that is as a will to power. So some have said that there's an element of resentment of the weakness and perhaps sense of, by comparison, uh, resentment against the powerful and over a period of time deepening into hatred and the attempt is me made to point out weaknesses in those who have been, you know, held up historically so that if there's a wart on someone's body, the focus is on that wart alone and all is wart and you kind of humiliate and humble, really humiliate those who claim to have power as an expression of resentiment. So that's one line that has been brought up. It's been maintained by Derrida, among others. Foucault made it clearly it's a matter of power Nietzsche early had made it a will to power. And Derrida and others said it's all a matter of interpretation, construction, and it needs to be deconstructed. Now let's see how that goes. The power oppression narrative that is being given by Marx and neo-Marxism can spit along many um, marks of diversity without being able to privilege any of these uh, sources of diversity. This is sometimes referred to as intersectionality, white privilege uh, in a majority white society would not be any different from black privilege in a majority black society or patriarchy over matriarchy or um, straight over gay. Notice um, gender is not fixed, it's fluid, it may vary from moment to moment. You walk into a restroom, one gender, and you can come out another gender. This is a natural result of um, man as the measure of all things. It could be each man, and each man at any moment is the measure. And you cannot object, your objection is just another form of oppression. 
whatever form it takes. So we have a hopeless power struggle that is ever increasing by inter not intersectionality. Think of someone who's gay, white, female, poor, educated, and non-intellectual. All of this is based on skepticism that nothing is clear. And um, <clears throat> it's the opposite of the theist view that um, of clarity and, and inexcusability. Uh, all is matter, all is natural. That's the fideistic part. I say we cannot know, it's assumed, fideistic being that all is matter. And when you're dead, you're dead. Well, it reminds me also of Hume when he said that when I look inside, all I see are mental images. Yes. Just the flux, the change of consciousness, but there's no being who's having these mental images. Yes, he simply, he stumbles at the threshold. He overlooks them. There's, there's no permanence. There's only change. Yes, and, you know, Buddhism does that too. All is dukkha, impermanent, flux, and the questions have been raised there. These things, empiricism and skepticism, are recurrent throughout history. And there are other things that equally turn away from reason, namely intuition, or sometimes common sense, appearance as reality. Intuition says um, uh, the sign is a reality. So there are many ways to turn away from uh, reason, and I've tried to identify this in the early part of the book Philosophical Foundation, published in 2008. Now, uh, to continue and try to wrap it up here, um, <clears throat> there's no meaning nor possibility of meaning, but we're driven only by desire in a restless boredom to ever-increasing excess concerning which no judgment should be made according to politically correct culture without receiving in return a torrent of abuse of all kinds, which is simply the exercise of power versus truth. We can hardly get the word truth out for discussion. It's assumed there is no truth, there can be no truth. So it goes back to the epistemology, is not as possible. So to wrap up, in the culture war, excuse me, we've gone uh, a bit longer than usual, in the culture war, power seeks to destroy the other and um, <clears throat> fails only if it is self-destructive first. The other side of the culture war, the historic theist view, um, approaches it differently. If it can repent, if theists can repent of its own unbelief and divisions that divide them, if they can do that, then they can call the world to repent and do this in the context of um, for the knowledge for the kingdom of heaven is at hand not something future and postponed but the, to be pursued now so these are some reflections and some basic features of postmodernism in the context of the culture war of non-theism against historic Christian theism. Thank you. And, and we put that in the larger context as well of the historic Christian faith. And so yes. in the previous episode and this es episode, we've covered a, a lot of history since the writing of the Westminster Confession of Faith in order to highlight challenges that are remaining to be answered. And so as yes. we begin to conclude this series, I, I think we can expect that in the next episode we'll be identifying those and challenges and thinking through how we can answer them in a way that's yes. consistent with historic Christianity. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you.